Hello and welcome to this session on cyber security. Today we are diving into the fascinating world of protecting our digital lives. From understanding how fast attacks shape this field, we are exploring the tools and techniques used to defend against modern threats. We are covering it all. Whether you're a beginner looking to get started in cyber security or just curious about how this field keeps us safe, this session is for you. I will guide you through real world examples practical tools and the essential skills every cybersecurity professional should know. So, grab a notebook and let's begin our journey into the exciting world of cybersecurity. Let's discover the past security attack, how it all began. Let me take you back to the 1980s, a time when computers were just starting to enter homes and offices. There wasn't much concern about viruses or hackers because the internet as we know it today didn't exist. But then, something happened that changed the world of technology forever. First, the Ben virus, which was created in 1986. Imagine two brothers in Pakistan, Parasit and Jat Alvi. They created a program to protect their medical software from being pirated. Their intention was simple. If someone copied their software illegally, this virus would embed itself into the computer as a sort of warning message. But here's the twist. They didn't predict how fast Spread. Every time someone inserted a floppy disk into an infected computer, the virus copied itself onto the disk. From there, it traveled to other computers, and within months, it had spread globally. Although it didn't destroy data, it slowed down computers and disrupted work, showing the world just how vulnerable our systems could be. Next is the love letter malware. It was created in the year 2000. Picture this, you open your email and you see a message from someone titled, I love you. Attached is a file named, love letter for you. Curious, you clicked on it, thinking it's a romantic message. But instead, your computer gets infected with your malware. This malware scanned your address book and sent itself to all your contacts. It also stole your password and sensitive information. Within hours, the love letter malware spread itself to millions of computers worldwide, costing over $10 billion in damages. It was one of the first attacks that exploited human emotions, our curiosity and trust. What do these stories teach us? First, even well-meaning programs like the brain virus can wreak havoc without safeguards. Second, attackers like those behind the love letter malware began to understand how to manipulate human behavior, something we call social engineering today. These events were the wake-up call the world needed. They led to the creation of antivirus software, incident response teams, and even laws to regulate digital security. Now that we've explored the history of early cyber attacks, let's talk about the digital age. Today, with billions of devices connected to the internet, attackers no longer need floppy disks or viruses to cause chaos. Everything can happen in seconds. And not when the weakest link is not the technology, it is us, the users. Let's start with one of the most common attacks, phishing. Phishing is when an attacker tricks you into revealing sensitive information like password, credit card details, or even access to your company's network. How? Usually through fake emails, websites, or even messages that look convincing. For example, you might receive an email that looks like it's from your bank, asking you to update your account details. The email might even include a link to your website that looks identical to your bank's login page. The moment you enter your details, they are stolen. Let's look at the types of phishing. The first is spare phishing. This is a targeted phishing. Instead of sending generic emails, attackers will search their victims. They might even know your name, your job, or even the projects you're working on. For example, a spare phishing email might pretend to be from your manager asking you to send confidential files. Next is whaling. This is phishing aimed at high-level executives like the CEOs. Why? Because these individuals have access to the most valuable data. Next type is phishing. This is phishing over the phone. An attacker might call you pretending to be from tech support, asking you to share your computer's login credentials to fix an issue. And the last type is smishing. This involves text messages. You might receive an SMS saying you've won the prize and all you need to do is click on a link. Clicking on it will install your malware on your phone or lead you to a fake login page. The next attack is social engineering. Phishing is just one example of a broader category called social engineering. Social engineering is all about exploiting human psychology. Instead of hacking into systems, 
attackers manipulate people to get what they want. Let's look at what makes social engineering effective. First is trust. People tend to trust authority figures or familiar brands. For example, if you get an email that looks like it's from a trusted vendor, you are less likely to question it. The next is urgency. Attackers create a sense of urgency to make you act without thinking. For instance, a message might say your account will be locked in the next 24 hours unless you verify your details. The next one is fear. Fear can cloud judgment. Imagine receiving a call claiming your social security number has been compromised. You might panic or give away personal information. And lastly, curiosity or desire. Humans are naturally curious. Emails with subject lines like, congratulations, you've won, or exclusive offer for you, often tempt people to click. Some common social engineering tactics include impersonation, which is pretending to be someone you trust, like a colleague or IT support. We have baiting and tailgating. Other attacks include ransomware, wireless malware, and botnet. What do these attacks feature? They remind us that cybersecurity is not just about firewalls and antivirus software. It's about awareness. Next, let's discuss the eight certified information system security professional security domain, also known as the ATISSP security domain. In cybersecurity, professionals handle various tasks from protecting data to ensuring secure communication. To organize this work, the CISSP certification defines eight security domains. Think of these as categories that cover all aspects of cyber security. Let's dive into each one with examples and how they connect to keeping systems and people safe. The first domain is security and risk management. This domain is all about setting the foundation for security in an organization. It focuses on creating security policies, managing risks, and ensuring compliance with laws and regulations like the GDPR or HIPAA. For example, imagine a company dealing with sensitive medical records. A security analyst ensures compliance with HIPAA by creating policies to protect patient records. Without clear policies, teams would know how to handle security challenges effectively. The next domain is asset security. How do you protect things that matter most to an organization? This is where asset security comes in. It focuses on securing digital and physical assets like computers, data, and sensitive documents. It also includes data storage and disposal. When old hard drives are no longer needed, an analyst ensures they are securely wiped and destroyed to prevent data leaks. The next domain is security architecture and engineering. This domain focuses on designing systems and tools to protect data and networks, focuses on firewalls, encryption, and secure system design. This also includes understanding the emerging technologies like cloud security. For example, setting up a firewall to filter out malicious traffic or encrypting sensitive communications to prevent interception. Strong architecture ensures that attackers face significant barriers to accessing critical systems. The next domain is communication and network security. This domain covers how information travels and ensuring that it remains secure during transit. They focus on securing wired and wireless networks and preventing unauthorized access during transmission. An analysts might monitor network traffic for suspicious activity like multiple login attempts and unusual locations. Without secure communication, sensitive information can be intercepted or altered. The next domain is identity and access management. Who get access to what? This domain is about ensuring the right people have access to the right resources. We focus on managing user identities, access permissions, and authentication methods like biometrics or two-factor authentication. For example, setting up a multi-factor authentication for employees to ensure they verify their identity before accessing critical systems. Compromised accounts are one of the most common ways attackers gain access to systems. The next domain is security assessment and testing. Regular testing and assessment ensure that systems are prepared to handle attacks. Focuses on audits, penetration testing, and vulnerability assessment. For example, a team might simulate a phishing attack to see how many employees will fall for it, and then use the results to improve training. Proactive testing helps identify weaknesses before attackers can employ them. Next domain is security operations. This is where the actions happen. Detecting, responding to, 
and recovering from threats. Focuses on incident response, disaster recovery, and continuous monitoring of system for threats. For example, an analyst might respond to an alert about a malware infection, isolate the affected system, and ensure it's cleaned before reconnected. A quick response can mean the difference between a minor incident and a major breach. The final domain focuses on integrating security in the software development lifecycle. This domain is known as the software development security. It focuses on secure coding practices, testing for vulnerabilities, and managing user data securely in an application. Poorly developed software can become a backdoor for attackers to exploit. So, during the, the development of a new app, a security analyst may ensure that all users' passwords are encrypted and stored securely. These eight domains provide a comprehensive framework for managing security. Together, they ensure that all aspects of an organization's security, people, processes, and technology are accounted for. Next, let's discuss frameworks, security controls, and ethics in cybersecurity. Let's start with frameworks. What are frameworks? Frameworks are like a roadmap for organizations to manage risks and protect assets. They provide structured guidelines on how to build a security strategy. Frameworks help organizations identify risks, set security goals, and ensure compliance with regulations like the GDPR or HIPAA. The examples of the framework include the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, the ISO 27001, and the PCI DSS, which is designed to protect credit cards for organizations handling payment processing. Next, let's talk about security controls. Security controls are the specific tools and actions organizations use to reduce risks and protect against threats. Think of them as a building blocks to a strong security framework. The types of security controls include preventive controls. These controls stop attacks before they happen. Examples include firewalls, and strong password policy. The next type is detective control. These controls help to identify potential security incidents. For example, intrusion detection system, also known as IDS, or SIM tool, also known as the security information and event management tool. And the last type is the corrective tool. These tools help to respond to and mitigate attacks. For example, restoring data from backup after a ransomware attack. A company may use encryption, a preventive control, to secure sensitive files and an encryption detection system, a detective tool to monitor network traffic for suspicious activity. Now, let's talk about how frameworks and controls work together. Frameworks outline the what. These are the goals and strategies organizations should follow, while controls handle the how. These are the tools and techniques used to achieve those goals. For example, the NIST framework might suggest encrypting sensitive data. The organization would then use tools like AES encryption and security control to meet this guideline. Next, let's talk about the ethics in cybersecurity. With great power comes great responsibility. Cybersecurity professionals have access to sensitive data and systems, which makes ethics a cornerstone of the field. The key principles of ethics in cybersecurity are confidentiality, which means protecting private information. For example, you shouldn't access a co-worker's payroll details just because you can. Next is privacy protection, respecting individual privacy. If an employee's personal data is exposed and a breach, you are ethically bound to inform them, even if it is uncomfortable for the organization. And lastly, adhering to laws. Cybersecurity professionals must follow the law, such as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, vigilantism like Counter-attacking hackers is illegal in many countries and can escalate conflicts. Why does ethics matter? Ethical lapses can lead to breaches, lawsuits, and loss of trust. As a professional, your role is to act as a guardian, not just for systems, but for the people behind them. For example, if you discover a friend at work leaking sensitive data, do you report them? The ethical answer is yes. Security policies and protocols must apply to everyone equally. And lastly, let's talk about the common security tools and their role in cybersecurity. To protect against modern cyber threats, cybersecurity professionals rely on a variety of tools. These tools help monitor systems, 
detect vulnerabilities and respond to incidents efficiently. Let's break down some of the most commonly used tools and how they play a role in keeping systems secure. First tool is Security Information and Event Management Tool, pronounced as SIM. What do they do? SIM tools collect, analyze, and display data from multiple sources like firewalls, servers, and endpoints to detect and respond to threats in real time. Examples of those tools are Splunk, which is a popular tool for analyzing logs and creating dashboards to visualize potential security threats. Next is Chronicle which is a cloud native team tool that focuses on speed and scalability for identifying threats. Why does this tool matter? Imagine trying to manually review thousands of logs for suspicious activity. Team tools automate this process, saving time and reducing error. Next tool, the Network Protocol Analyzer, also known as the Packet Sniffers. What do they do? These tools capture and analyze network traffic to identify unusual patterns potential bridges or data leaks. Examples of those tools are Wireshark, which is one of the most widely used network analyzers. It helps professionals inspect packet level data to identify potential intrusion. Why does it matter? By examining data packets, professionals can pinpoint the exact moment and methods an attacker use to gain access. The next tool we have are Playbooks. Playbook a step-by-step -step guide that outlines how to respond to specific security incidents. If a ransomware attack occurs, a playbook might include steps like isolating infected systems, notifying stakeholders, and recovering data from backups. Playbooks ensure a consistent and efficient response to incidents, reducing the risk of mistakes during high-pressure situations. The next tool is antivirus and endpoint detection tool. They detect and remove malware or suspicious behavior on individual systems. Examples are Norton Antivirus, CrowdStrike Falcon. These tools act as the first line of defense against threats like ransomware and spyware. The next tool is the encryption tool. They convert sensitive data into unreadable format to protect it from unauthorized access. Examples are the Advanced Encryption Standard, also known as the AES, is widely used for securing data in transit and at rest. We also have the BitLocker, which is also a tool for encrypting hard drives. Encryption ensures that even if data is stolen, it remains unusable to attackers. Beyond tools, certain technical skills are indispensable for cybersecurity professionals. Let's look at how Linux, SQL, and Python form the backbone of many security professionals. Linux, the command line powerhouse, is an open source operating system known for its security, flexibility, and command line interface. It can be used for log analysis and penetration testing. Linux is lightweight and highly customizable, making it a favorite for cyber security tasks like cyber monitoring and forensics. SQL, also pronounced as SQL, stands for Structured Query Language. It is used to interact with databases, allowing professionals to store, retrieve, and analyze data efficiently. It can be used for log searching and incident investigation. With organizations generating massive amounts of data, SQL makes it possible to pinpoint security incidents quickly. And lastly, Python is security professional's best friend. Python is a high-level programming language known for its simplicity and versatility. It can be used for automation, data passing, software development. Python is easy to learn and integrates well with most security tools, making it a go-to language for automation and problem solving. Cyber security, tools like SIMs and packet sniffers are essential for detection and response. However, mastering foundational skills like Linux, SQL, and Python will elevate your ability to automate tasks, analyze data, and stay one step ahead of attackers. Cyber security is more than just technology. It's about people, processes, and the ethical responsibility to protect sensitive information. By understanding tools, frameworks, and principles, you are not just learning a skill, you are preparing to defend the digital world. Remember, staying curious and committed to learning is your greatest asset in this ever evolving field. Let's continue to build a safer and more secure future together. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.